no, no goldfinches at your bird feeder? We've had one, two. <laughs> Anybody got a summer tanager coming to their feeder? Uh, yeah. We have one male. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, I think all of you know about this book. Um, you've all seen it. My wife, Donna, wrote a good part of it. My daughter, Vanessa, wrote some of it. Um, but it's free, and it's, I think, very valuable for information. And then how many have read Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home? Anybody? A few of you? Required reading. Everything I'm going to say tonight just comes out of this book. And Don and I started the nursery because native plants were our hobby. Um, and then in 2007, when this was published the first time, there was the light. Uh, there was all the science behind why native plants are so important. And I think this has been its 15th printing at least now. Bringing nature home if you haven't read it. Okay. okay. Are you ready? Can you hear me okay? Okay. So why care about changing our landscaping into a more, serving a more ecological function? Doug Tallamy says that we have 54% of our country is urban and suburban. 41% is in agriculture. That adds up to 95. We're down to 5% natural in our nation. Um, why is nature important? It cleans our air and water for us. It produces oxygen. I like breathing oxygen. It pollinates our food crops. It eats insects that we consider pests. It recycles dead organic matter. Um, these are free ecological services that are just priceless. And it's all for free if we take care of nature. Doug Tallamy says that we need to create homegrown national park by using our yards, millions of yards, to rebuild what used to be here in our country. We add 500 square miles of lawn to our country every year. We dump 700 million pounds of pesticides on our lawns every year, which is 10 times what all of agriculture uses. Um, it's interesting when, I, when we talk about this, what's left of our natural country. Uh, you know, Donna and I recently drove to the Delmarva Peninsula, very nice farmland. And then out in the country, you just see masses of homes and apartments being built on these farms. Same thing if you drive to Denver, went there last year, all through the Great Plains, all the farms, you come up to some little town and all around it is new construction covering up that farmland. And Doug Tallamy also says we need to reduce the amount of lawn we have in our yards because most of Eastern North America was forest and 70% of that, that is gone. Um, so most of our Eastern wildlife needs forests for their primary habitat. And why American plants, why native plants? I think you all know this, but I'll go through it just in case. Um, it all has to do with chemistry and um, American plants can only be utilized by, or I'll put it this way, American insects can only utilize American plants primarily for food. And these insects are the base of the food chain. Um, and so these American plants 
and American insects have been evolving for hundreds of millions of years together. And the plants don't want to be eaten. The insects need something to eat. The plant says, I'm going to develop a toxin, so you can't ever eat me anymore. And the insect says, OK, well, I'm going to take 100 million years, and I'm going to develop an enzyme that will break down your toxin. And then I'll eat some of you. And so the classic example is the monarch butterfly and its caterpillar, which can only eat milkweeds that are rather poisonous. And yet, these caterpillars have developed the ability to break down these toxins. Um, but it only took several hundred million years. And so another good example is the Chinese tallow tree in China, where it's a very good native tree. There are about 300 species of insects that can utilize it in China. And in our country, where it's taking over the southeastern United States, there are three insects that can use that plant. And so as the Chinese tallow takes over and pushes out all of our Native American plants, all of our insects will go with it. There will be nothing to eat. Because it'll only take another 100 million years for ours to adapt. We won't be here then. Um, before I actually get into the plants, I did want to mention, Donna had a couple of things to talk about. Uh, you know, Doug Tallamy basically says, you just need to reduce the amount of herbicides and pesticides that we use in our lawns. Um, to us, that seems pretty obvious. Um, but one of the good examples to me is that recently in Tallahassee, in the last couple of years, these companies have come in that are going to spray your lawn for mosquitoes. Um, they might use a garlic spray, which is okay. They might use pyrethrum, which is a very good organic pesticide to kill the mosquitoes, and it will kill everything in your yard, organic or not. It's going to kill them. All the good things that we want, they're not immune. Um, limit the use of exterior lighting. The, the thousands of moths that we have here at night, they're drawn to these lights, and they just end up dying there. Um, Anytime you can reduce the outdoor lighting, it's a good thing, especially for these uh, nocturnal moths. Switch from a white LED to something yellow or amber or red. Um, I know when I grew up here in Tallahassee, the front porch light was always yellow. And yet I, I don't know that I've ever seen a yellow light on a por porch in the last 40 years. So Donna and I have been learning and changing our ideas about landscaping for 40 years. And our yard is an ongoing project. We keep planting new things all the time. We're down to about six non-native species of shrubs in our yard. Um, and, uh, but we're up to 117 native species. You know, everything, trees, shrubs, perennials, whatever, little wildflowers. And uh, Craig Eagle, a Floridian who has spoken here for us probably in the past and for the Native Plant Society. He says, we need to think of our landscapes as more than window dressing and let it serve a beneficial ecological function. And that's what we're trying to do. So this little chickadee, Doug Tallamy's research is showing that this little bird and its partner is going to collect between 350 and 570 caterpillars a day to feed a clutch of four or five babies. I mean, I can't imagine. Can you imagine if I gave you a little chickadee family and said, go find food? Unbelievable. That adds up to between six and 9,000 caterpillars for the 16 days that they're in the nest. Um, okay, Donna. Kathleen, what am I doing in terms of the remote and advancing?
worked. It worked a minute ago. Keyboard. Oh yeah, I'll try that. Let me try. It. I'll try it right here. Within yours oh, to uh, oh, that one? Okay, that's all right. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Are we done? Is it working now? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Doug Tallamy says more or less four ways to uh, create a functional ecological landscape. And it's right here. Providing for pollinators through, I mean, throughout the growing season. But Donna and I would say you need to provide for uh, pollinators all year. And so the winter is so important in terms of their wintering habitat. Uh, they may be overwintering in the soil or hollow stems, like an old hollow pokeweed stem or something, or even smaller stems, or they may be uh, staying warm underneath the leaf litter of just the forest floor, or mulch in your yard. The plants should be the base of the food web, obviously, using native plants, food for insects, berry seeds, nuts, whatever. Carbon sink, you know, you just try to plant some nice trees that are gonna live two or 300 years if you can. And then uh, contributing to the watershed management. Um, I'm not really going to talk about this much, but it's just the fact that a forest floor, a mulch, a mulch situation is going to absorb a lot more water than a lawn in terms of runoff. This slide shows a carbon sink with the big trees, overstory trees, understory trees, a little hawthorn tree up here, and then uh, Jim Stevenson's favorite tree in the forest, a dead one. Very useful trees. And then in this picture also in the very, very foreground, you can see we've got our herbaceous stuff with like a, a Baptisia right here and then uh, the native grasses, whatever. Just have all the different layers. This is Ann and Don Morrow's yard. And when they bought the house 30 years ago, I think it was pretty much just uh, pine trees and lawn. And Ann and Don have, um, over the years, have added um, a real diversity to the overstory with hardwoods and understory hardwoods, understory shrubs, wildflowers, grasses, herbaceous plants. That's their backyard. And um, I think that pretty, the pretty fall color, I think, is an American beech they've planted. And the tree closest to us is a blue beech. They've got needle palm, ferns, uh, um, a pollinator garden that you can't see is beyond in the far back. She has a nice little sunnier spot for some pollinator plants and little to no lawn in the backyard. Doug Tallamy also talks about structural diversity, and here he just really does, I think, mostly just talk about structures like, you know, bird baths for birds to get water, um, bird houses for nesting if they're cavity nesters, and then brush piles is a nice thing for cover. What's wrong with that bluebird box? Not enough ventilation holes. It's going to get hot in there this summer. At the nursery, at Native Nurseries, whenever we have to cut down a tree, we like to leave part of it standing for as long as it's stable and safe. But this tree in the foreground, unbelievable in terms of hiding places for insects, summer and winter. It's just a spectacular place for hiding and overwintering. So if you can leave a snag that's not gonna pose a threat to your house, great. And lawns. Um, freedom lawns is what the new term is for freedom from herbicides, freedom from pesticides, freedom from uh, fertilizer, freedom from water. Where's Jim Steve? Jim, how often do you water your lawn? Never in 40 years. How often do you fertilize it? Never. And it looks nice too, I would say. So this picture is in, the, is, is in the yard next to the nursery, and that's all blue-eyed grass. And it just came up there as weeds. 
probably from seeds that um, came from the nursery. And uh, if you have something like this, you just let it bloom maybe in the spring. And then after that, okay, start mowing. My lawn is full of weeds um, and I mow it and it looks great. Uh, there are four weeds that I actually spend quite a bit of time on my hands and knees going after uh, all summer. Doveweed, skunk vine, <laughs> glycoma, and wandering tradescantia. Um, my, y'all skunk vine, huh? Skunk vine, if, if you don't know what it is, it's probably going to be covering your house over the next five years. It's a bad one that's coming. Um, but the other weeds in my yard, like Florida betony, um, I don't worry about pulling it out of my lawn. When I cut the grass, it all looks good. It's all the same height. And so whatever other weeds like that, uh, the first four I mentioned, I, just, I go after them intensively on my hands and knees because I know if I don't, they're going to kill my lawn completely. And I do like a little lawn. Some lawn is okay for pets, kids, access to areas in your yard. And Donna and I think it actually reduces your amount of maintenance you'll do in your yard um, with lawn, even though it's not a great thing. Just don't have too much of it. So this is Rob Williams' yard. And... Um, The one thing I wanted to mention about this was up by his front porch, you see the big yellow plant up there, goldenrod. And it's what Doug Tallamy is calling a keystone species. And by that, he means that there are particular insects that have to have goldenrod. And if you don't have it, you don't have those insects. And yet there are a whole bunch of other insects that aren't specialists on goldenrod, but they'll use the goldenrod. So it's just a spectacular plant, and yet it's so important for some real particular species of insects. And Rob has just started planting trees here, as you see. And um, in between time, while they're growing, he's leaving his lawn, because it's easier to mow that little area than it is to hand weed it if he doesn't want undesirable weeds. And as the trees grow, they'll create more shade, they'll drop more leaves, and that lawn will be, um, be disappearing over time just because of excess shade and leaves. And then that whole area there will become one nice bed all tied together with the mulch. Another bed in, in Rob's lawn where he's got other trees started. And that larger tree you see there, right there, is a Hercules club, which is somewhat unusual. I usually just see them down in the night down at St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. Um, but that's the larval food for the giant swallowtail caterpillars because it's related to citrus. So this little bed, he's tied together and that bed will just grow over time. He'll reduce his lawn area uh, as the trees grow and shade the lawn out and he'll end up with less lawn and more forest floor. So Rob's yard is the one that's going to be on the yard tour. The other slide there is, is uh, Park Sebastian. Very desirable uh, light shade shrub for us. This is Brian Bryson's yard. He's one of our landscape designers. And um, the white flower is white doll's eye, Boltonia. And the little daisies there, yellow is Rebecca Herta. I think the Boltonia he grew as a plant, one little four-inch plant that he bought at the nursery. And the uh, Rebecca was all from seed. And I think that if you do wildflowers from seed, it's going to vary from year to year. Uh, it depends on things like the amount of mulch you use and, and what type of mulch you might use. Uh, the amount of disturbance you create in that bed by stomping around in there, weeding or whatever might create changes each year. And of course, the seed production from year to year may differ. And you might want to leave all this debt. If this, once the winter hits and kills all this vegetation back, uh, you might want to leave it for winter habitat for hiding insects. Depends on, you know, your image of beauty in your yard and how clean you have to have it. Everybody's different. 
this is uh, my yard. And when we bought the house, this is what it looked like 30 years ago. And what you see, it looks like, um, it looks like shadows across this boxwood hedge and sunlight. But what that is, is that's a white dwarf azalea. And that's a boxwood, white dwarf azalea. And boxwood and white dwarf, there's a white dwarf azalea sandwiched in boxwood. And these are all just the regular beautiful azaleas that Tallahassee has, Podocarpus. So I think this is very standard for probably 99% of the yards in Tallahassee. Every landscape consists of 100% non-native plants. And it's because plants from Asia or Europe or Australia, uh, if the climate is correct, they do very well in Tallahassee. And our insects don't like to eat them. So people like those plants. But it should be the exact opposite. We want plants in our yards that the insects will eat. Because when you go out into nature, you don't say, wow, look at all the defoliated trees. The insects have eaten every leaf in the forest. You don't even notice what they've eaten. And so to have those native plants in your yard is just the way to go. And then also, uh, can you see? Here we go, never mind. So this is now my front yard. Um, Understory trees up by the front porch. That's a little parsley hawthorn. And we've got kunti up there by the porch and native ferns. Um, and then out in the sunlight, those are what we would consider our pollinator gardens, butterflies, hummingbirds, bees. And over to the right-hand side, uh, as you'll see in the next slide, that's a, a big natural forest floor covered by live oak limbs. So the pollinator garden, um, the pretty yellow thing you see is Heliopsis. It's a spectacular native wildflower. And the um, this stuff in here is all going to be six feet tall in September, narrow leaf sunflower, big, beautiful September, October, the beautiful little sun, native sunflowers. But also, as you might notice, um, that's a petunia. It's not native, but we use a few things like that just because it's pretty for human beings. It might be functional as for some insects, I don't know, but we like it, a little spot of color. And we have herbs in there like oregano and rosemary that we use, but the pollinators love both of them. That's what our yard looks like now. Um, That's a mixture of the narrow leaf sunflower, the tall six foot, pretty yellow sunflower in October. But half of that also is probably dwarf ironweed, beautiful dark purple in the spring for pollinators. And then the leaf litter. And we, we put very little pine straw mulch around in our yard. We use it occasionally to dress up an area. I think it's a very nice product. And it does make your yard look very nice if you use it occasionally and here and there. But I think too, um, the mulch here is just American beech leaves from a tree that's nearby. And uh, so we don't really add any additional mulch that we buy from the store. It's just pretty much all of our yard. It's whatever falls on the ground stays on the ground. And that's, I think, probably the best way in terms of insects uh, overwintering in it and utilizing it. I was amazed to read recently about how many moth caterpillars eat nothing but dead leaves on the ground. And then also in terms of the mulch, um, if you have a tree in your lawn, the idea, Doug Tallamy has really suggested, he's really pushing the fact that, like I just said, these moths, some of the moths um, eat only dead leaves on the ground, but if you have a tree in your lawn, it's best to have the natural leaf litter all the way out to the drip line of the tree as far as the branches might extend because all the hundreds or thousands of caterpillars up in that treetop that are eating the leaves, most of them when they're done are just gonna fall to the ground, 
find a place hiding in the leaves to pupate and then come out of some beautiful moth. And if it's lawn under that tree, they're dead. They need that natural leaf litter. Up by the street of our house, nice oak leaf hydrangea, Virginia creeper, and that little rabbit, they love to hide in that, under that oak leaf hydrangea. And then um, things like this, dead pokeweed stems that we leave up all winter for the insects to hide inside, overwinter in. And now let me talk about trade-offs. Seeing this Virginia creeper makes me think of the vines that we have in our yards. They're all very desirable native vines. Uh, um, Virginia creeper, smilax, making lots of berries for bird food. Trumpet vine for hummingbirds. And we don't allow any of this stuff to climb our trees. And so right there, our trade-off is that we're taking away all those berries that the birds would have eaten in the fall or winter. But in terms of us and our maintenance you know, requirements and the time we want to put into our yard, every berry that's in that tree is going to come to our lawn, probably in a bird poop, and sprout. And then I have to pull it up. And I've got enough of that already. So the one thing that I do is we don't allow vines in our trees. Another trade-off that we do we have a beautiful cabbage palm in our front yard, you'll see in a minute. We let it bloom and let the pollinators use the flowers. When the flowers are done, I don't let the berries, I don't let it set berries and I don't let the berries ripen. I cut all the berry stalks off and compost them. I'll put them on our brush pile because I've seen too many yards over the years when cabbage palms are around in a yard setting. Um, you'll have hundreds of cabbage palms and they are extremely difficult to dig up when they're this tall. So it's a trade-off that we make. American lady butterfly in our yard on a purple cone flower. American lady, as opposed to a painted lady, I think. So this... This is the partially hawthorn that's in the front of our house. And um, I want to talk about it in terms of pollinator plants. Um, if I was a bee or a butterfly, would I go to a little wildflower like that purple cone flower that maybe had 20 little flowers in that disc? Or would I go to a tree that has 10,000 flowers? So when you think about pollinator plants, don't overlook trees. Uh, you know, let's think of a, a black tupelo tree, it might be 80 feet tall and probably has hundreds of thousands of flowers up there or a big basswood tree. Unbelievable pollinator plants. You know, yet we think of pretty little yellow daisies as our pollinator plants. But it's all in the trees, really, is what are so important. And then if you're a, a moth primarily, maybe a butterfly, and you want to provide food for your babies, where are you going to go? Where are you going to lay your eggs? On a little parsley plant there? Or on the top of a massive white oak? Um, all the caterpillar activity is in the treetops. And that's why they're so important for the birds for finding this protein, those caterpillars. Uh, every year, we live under a couple of big live oak trees in our yard. And um, I could tell, I think this past November even, I walked out into my driveway. There's this big caterpillar poop, caterpillar frass um, on my driveway. And it had fallen from our big live oak. And I'll never see the moth because I'm not up all night. It's some beautiful silk moth up there probably eating the live oak leaves. And just the fact that you see the frass tells you that it's up there, but I'm ignorant of all that that happens up there. But the birds know it's there.
Uh, this is sort of an area in our yard where it's pretty wet. It's not really a true rain garden, but all the water, a lot of the water from our driveway flows through here. And you can see we've just got some nice irises in there. And that white flowering thing in the background is a Virginia sweet spire. This plant right by the house is a high bush blueberry. The cardinals love that plant. They love the berries. And when we sit in the office and look out the window, they always spit the peeling out. They, they always peel it before they swallow it. Same plant, Virginia sweet spire. And you can see the beginnings of a uh, mountain laurel growing up here. Now it's a good six feet tall. And that area, this whole area used to be lawn when we bought the house. And so that's all gone now in favor of what you see. So that's our front yard. Um, the big live oak tree uh, limbs, all the forest floor underneath there, and the pollinator gardens out here. Our petunia. That's the same bed. You can see the big live oak tree. And that limb extends, there are two limbs that extend across our driveway um, that I've had to prop up so that we can get our cars under it. Um, you see the big cabbage palm in the background where I let the pollinators use the flowers. And the little tree in the front is a red buckeye. And then the pretty yellow blossoms are Senecio or Pacara is the new name, I believe. And the purple woodland phlox. This is also under the same bed. Actually, this happens first. Uh, this will be, the trillium might be up now, today, and the bloodroot will come soon after. Um, that bloodroot, as you can see, we have a few. And um, we think we planted two or three out there. And they are just taking over, and it's a beautiful sight. Also in terms of pollinators, this is under the same bed. This, this what we call it Indian pink or spigelia. Um, excellent hummingbird plant. I'm not sure if there's any moths or bees that can use it because of the long tube flower. But um, I mean, they're pollinated. All the, all the shade loving wildflowers need pollinators too. You know, so you may think, oh, the pollinator plants have to be out in the sun. But if you have shade, it's that, that Senecio you saw and the woodland flocks and this Spigelia, the Indian thing. They all need pollinators, so they're all great pollinator plants. Our backyard. About 1 20th of our backyard, I would say, is lawn. You can see a little patch down there. I can't see it, um, but um, this area up until maybe, Donna, is it in five years maybe or less? That was all uh, ground cover of Liriope. Um, and it had been, we had lived with it there for 20 years because it was a nice ground cover, it was green. And then one day we said, why are we leaving that there? Why don't we put in native wildflowers? So it took us 20 years to figure that out. A beautiful blue beech tree, um, native fern, all just the mulched area, not much lawn. There's our lawn in the backyard. Um, a nice low bird bath and uh, Virginia sweet spire because it gets a Virginia sweet spire. That is a wetland plant. It doesn't have to be in the wetlands, but since the bird bath is there, we're always re filling it to keep the uh, Asian tiger mosquitoes out of it. And so the Virginia sweet spire loves that little bit of extra water and some irises. And this picture was taken before we removed all that Liriope, so that's not there now. And then a blue stem palmetto. I love that plant. Um, eight foot tall spikes in the spring with white flowers for pollinators. And I do let the berries ripen and uh, let the birds have them. Last winter, we had hermit thrush, cedar waxwing, mockingbird, catbird, and cardinals eating them. So it's a very nice, uh, 
pretty large evergreen shrub for some light shade, blue stem palmetto. Our backyard in the winter, um, leaving up the little, uh, that was mostly ironweed, I think, that you're looking at there now, those dead stalks of ironweed. And you know, when I put up that bluebird box a couple of summers ago, I assembled everything, walked away, and within 10 seconds, two chickadees and a Carolina wren were on that box. That's a needle palm next to it. And you know, one of the one of the non-native plants that we kept in our yard it happens to be one of these old camellias. They were probably planted in the night in the 60s, and we've kept some of them because they're pretty. They're evergreen cover, but they offer, of course, no food at all for wildlife. Some of you may know uh, Vanessa Chrysler and her husband Richard. Vanessa Chrysler has, has uh, grown the wildflowers for us for the last few years that we sell at the nursery. She started off with a clean slate in Benton Hills. Other than that unfortunate task of removing bamboo, this is her front yard. And so the main thing you see here that she's added, and it's grown, I can't believe how fast it's grown, uh, but that's a white oak, beautiful fall color. And the yellow is a graybeard tree or fringe tree. This is the other side of her yard, front yard. Well, there you can actually see the graybeard blooming now in one of those shots. And her beds are pretty organized and uh, weed free. Um, but the reason why is because she's using these as stock plants for her to collect seed from to grow her babies to sell at the nursery. So that's how she's organized hers and got rid of a lot of lawn. So the white oak that she has there, Doug Tallamy says that 534 species of mostly moths use white oak for food. And in our zip code, uh, in our oaks here, there are 395 species that utilize our oaks. And you can find this out by zip code by going to the Native Plant Finder in the National Wildlife Federation website, Native Plant Finder, and they're going to ask your zip code, and it'll tell you how many species of insects utilize certain species of plants. This is Vanessa and her backyard, uh, her water feature. They did that. Um, they get, of course, frogs, but they have turtles that pass through. They've had owls and snakes, and they've even had a bald eagle there. So water can be very important. Some of you have, may have known a, a guy from Tallahassee named David Copps. He lives in Colorado now, moved to, from Tallahassee. And this was his backyard. And my comment on his backyard in terms of maintenance is that um, if you have a yard this wild, um, I think it better be cut with a weed eater at least once a year so that you can see what's on the ground invading and slowly taking over. If you left all this stuff up for several years, it could be overrun with maybe skunk vine on the ground coming in. Um, and so, and even a yard like this Something that I wouldn't like personally, but this yard could be taken over by Bidens. As spectacular a plant as it is, Bidens is for pollinators. I find it undesirable in my yard. And so, you know, when you have a situation like this, it could involve um, just weeding tons of Bidens out, maybe. Doug Tallamy. He's here, come here a couple of times to speak in his book. This is his second book, you see, your Nature's Best Hope. Um, they're pretty much the same. You know, Nature's Best Hope, Bringing Nature Home, they're all very good. So I would sum up by saying that um, our yard, mine and Donna's yard, 
um, requires a lot of hand weeding, labor, on your knees, hot summer, mosquitoes biting you, and yet it brings us a lot of pleasure to watch these beautiful plants and animals go through their lives. So far, our health has allowed us to be able to do the work we do. At some point, it may not. Um, our yard isn't really natural. I would say it's just a controlled nature, controlled to the way we like it, um, with the trade-offs that I talked about to reduce maintenance and to, con and to uh, kind of fit our concept of beauty. Uh, but I do think that it serves a pretty good ecological function. Don, lights? Any questions? Yeah. The yeah, the question was, why did we use a parsley hawthorn by our front porch? And the reason is just because we think it's a pretty tree. But it, the other nice thing about it is that uh, the foliage is the larval food for the uh, red spotted purple, probably. And then that's the one I know. And it's probably larval food for another 20 or 50 that I don't know about. Yeah, we didn't want an 80 foot tree there. We wanted a 20 foot tree. Yep. Flatwoods plum. In our in our backyard, maybe three to five years ago, I don't remember, we had a beautiful, probably 50, 60, 70 year old Japanese magnolia there that bloomed beautifully for only one or two weeks though, a year. So we cut that magnificent thing down in favor of a native white oak. And that's what's there now. They're just moderate. They're not fast at all. They're not like a maple or a sycamore. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming.